Naturally, you have a great deal of negative press from certain Western countries, despite visible and tangible evidence of your achievements. How do you deal with these accusations and vilifications, both publicly and internally? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's a very, uh, very uh, good question. There is only so much that one can do, uh, and you, at, at least from my perspective, you always try to do what you can do, uh, and do the right thing and do it the right way. So, the negative press uh, from especially the Western world, uh, it, it, it's not new, it has been there in the last, uh, for the last 27 years, really, since 94, I remember. Uh, uh, so, there is not much I can do about it or any of us can do about it here in Rwanda because, um, yes, it is from the other end. That's how they see things. Whether correctly or not, that's how they or maybe that's how they want to see things. There's, there's how you see things, but there's also how you want to see things. Uh, I, I think in this case, maybe it is both. But so from the other side, ourselves, I, 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 there's no way I can change easily how someone wants to see me or sees me from their own uh, perspective. Uh, sometimes they must be looking at th us through the lenses of their own, where, where they come from, where things really might be different uh, from our own. Um, so th <laughs> there are ways maybe one can the first thing that comes to my mind, what, what needs, uh, what we can do in Rwanda, is take stock of what the press is saying. And, and try to analyze it and say, well, is this thing right about us? Or maybe it's wrong. Or, or does it have a basis? Maybe you, you may learn something and it may help you to correct something you, you, you can correct uh, if you really discover maybe they, they make sense. So that's where we, we concentrate. First, what we do in Rwanda and what we've tried to do for so many years now is, is really our business. <laughs> we think what we do is our business <laughs> before it becomes somebody else's business. And we do it for ourselves and we try to do it the best way we can because we are the ones who benefit from it or lose from that if we do wrong things. Uh, so that interaction between what perception is about you from outside and what you think is right for you to do for yourselves, really I think may help lead even to getting things better. But the concentration should be more on doing what you think is the right thing for you. So that's why we concentrate. We concentrate on saying whatever angle they attack from, uh, criticize and insult and do 
things and misrepresent us. And we still want to look at, could there be something maybe we need to pay attention to and bring it back to what we all along have been trying to do for ourselves and then see if it can improve us on, on many things or one thing or another and then we, we, we move along. Uh, that, that's the only option we have really to deal with that. Otherwise, it will take a very long time for me to uh, go into details of what I think about that. So I, I just maybe confine myself to these few important uh, remarks I, I've made. But we, we also know we have to deal with the world that, and here this is Africa, this is Rwanda, this is, there is uh, from the outside, the Western media and others, well, even sometimes the politicians from there. They really think they are entitled to present us as they want us to be, not as we want ourselves to be. So they always make that judgment of saying, what is he doing? But what is he doing? What is he doing about this, about that? About, is from how they would do them in their own place. Or sometimes, in fact, not consistent. Sometimes they may criticize you for doing what they do just because they think you are actually not entitled to doing that. You can't do that, that's not for you, it's for us. So <laughs> there is this back and forth that goes on forever. So in order not to be distracted and keep answering yourself on everything or being dragged to think like other people think and not think for yourselves about what we should be thinking and doing, you just concentrate on understanding what your problem is and trying to do the best you can to, to address it, whether they are small things or the hard things, holistically. But keep, keep hearing, listening, and, and learning. And learning may be one thing or two, and it doesn't matter to no, it doesn't matter, it won't do any harm for people to listen and say, oh, does this really merit criticism? Does it, uh, maybe it does. And if you find it does, then you, you, you address it, but always keeping in focus uh, what is for you. Because we are not supposed to be people just answering to others all the time. <laughs> or, 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 you know, framing our lives and our thinking just along the lines set by others. No, that, that's, uh, that's not for me, that's not for Rwandans, I think that's... Uh... So you're saying um, you don't ignore the criticism, you listen to it, you see what's merit, what, what, what is valid and what you might learn from it and how you might improve some things. Um, but then you're also very capable of, you know, separating that from criticism that maybe you don't feel is unjustified, and you also have your own standards and your own, um, you know. And one of the things that I love as well is very often you the spirit of agachiro that you talk about here in Rwanda. You know that you know um, believing in ourselves and and and, and self-sustenance, and I think that's a a wonderful spirit that others in Africa can also borrow. Um, okay, our, our next question um, comes from uh, another member of the room, uh, and his name is Kenning Jiroge. Uh, he's joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. 
Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Ken Jaroge. I'm an entrepreneur based in Nairobi, Kenya. Over the last 18 years, I co-founded and built a fintech company uh, that expanded across, across Africa. We have 18 uh, offices across Africa serving 35 countries. Uh, we employ about uh, 450 people, about 90% of them are young people between 25 and 30. Uh, we've been a proud uh, member of the room and a good partner to the AL Group. Uh, we sponsor uh, six uh, students throughout the university program. Uh, recently, we took another six in a graduate management program. The plan is to um, hire about six uh, to ten ALU students from the different campuses, Mauritius and the campus in Kigali. Uh, I have been a fan and a big follower of your leadership journey uh, over the last three decades, from the early days of the liberation struggle uh, to the current uh, the social and economic transformation of Rwanda. When I look at that journey, I see hope for the continent. And my question to you, Your Excellency, is um, what will Africa and Africans need to do over the next uh, two, three or four decades? Uh, to be able to mirror the kind of uh, growth and transformation that Rwanda has and for Africa to earn its uh, place in the global stage. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you for, for your remarks. And um, first, uh, the conversation that you have had here was about um, different... Uh, growth paths we, we, we see in Africa or can take uh, in different parts of our continent. And um, so I guess the problems of uh, Africa, Rwanda's, and where we have come from, we need one to find to understand that business should not be as usual, uh, and we must because there are comparisons to make. You look at look back in history, and then where we were 40 years ago. Now we are talking about 40 years ahead and see where others were at that time that were maybe equivalent in terms of uh, the standing in uh, social economic development. The last part, 40 years, we found those who were like different parts of our continent have moved ahead so many times and, and left our continent, our countries, the continent behind. Or oh, even where we were at that time, we have declined instead of. At the same time, like in Joroge again, he has just explained what he's doing, what he's able to do, and that means we actually can do certain things. We are able to do a number of things that contribute to raising our economies to uh, the social economic development to a much higher level than where we are now. So maybe we need, we need to be a little bit better organized on our continent and be deliberate and uh, treat what we are doing with a sense of urgency that there is a serious problem we have to address, not just for individuals. individuals on our continent, many of them solve their problems. They, they are well to do, they've been educated, they do business, they're entrepreneurs, they're innovators. They, you know, they. So at individual levels, we are doing fine. No, but here we are talking about now, well, but that's also a small number. It shouldn't, shouldn't be exaggerated compared to the rest. If you are talk, looking at the whole population of our continent, which is now getting over 1.2 billion people. Uh, so now the others, let's say, 
the 80% of that population. And then the countries of our continent uh, that should serve our own people. Uh, there has been, of course, in the past, this migration from rural to urban areas, which has both sides. It's a very good side of it. There is uh, also the downside to it in the sense that uh, these migrations, you know, really deliberate or uh, happening on the basis of the movement of talent and skills and, and so on and so forth. No. Or, or how about those who stay there? At what level do they stay uh, of this social economic uh, standing? So you find there is huge disparity. So I, I think the next four years we should be addressing this problem where Africa really, I mean, then we see the examples it needs to, we need to develop, we need to, and different uh, levels of our society need to be part of it and, and, and benefit as well so that the, the development you see in my country is not just uh, the 10% are doing fine, and then the 90%, uh, and then we count the, the worth of the 10% and say, oh, Rwanda is doing very well. No, Rwanda is not doing very well when you have 90 or 80% uh, you know, uh, left with nothing. So this is the problem we have to address. Building on, for example, the contributions that can be made by such uh, companies as Injuragas, fintechs in the financial sector, financial services, and then you can move to any other sector and look at uh, what is there, what I need to do to fill these gaps that remain, uh, that are huge. Uh, between these different levels of our society as far as the uh, social economic indicators are concerned, where Africa really uh, is way behind the rest of the world. So for Rwanda, therefore, and as part of Africa, and the Africa generally, we, ha we have some similarities in terms of opportunities as well as the problems we have before us that we have to manage. So it's organization. It's, uh, the, uh, I'm hesitating to say it's also largely political. The, the politics, the, the political economy of our countries need to be sorted out or looked at differently so that uh, uh, it's about uplifting everybody. It's about actually properly utilizing the resources we have, the immense resources we have. Uh, you know, the analogy that has gone around several times where it's like you have everything in your backyard and then you leave it there, you go begging. <laughs> or, or, or something else, sometimes you, you have everything around in your backyard, somebody comes and helps themselves with it, and then you run after them to say, give me something. Can I have some of it back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so this is, this is something that Africa needs to change, we, and, and we are capable of doing it. It's the person who asked the question, in Jorage, He's one of those who, and so many of them like him, are capable, if the politics, our politics allowed us to scale that up and spread it, and, and everybody, these young people who get educated and come up, you know, have that thinking of saying, no, but uh, it's not just for me. 
It's for my family, it's for my country, it's for my continent. It's, it's, and we can work together. So all these uh, things like the African continental free trade area that has been put in place, you know, the story about it. Uh, first of all, we, we thought about it too late already. It should have come 20 years ago. <laughs> 20, 30 years ago. Uh, same time, what does that mean? It means uh, our own countries are not trading with one another, like other countries uh, in other continents do. So it's like we are just small silos in, on our continent. and So we need to break these barriers deliberately and uh, also uh, we are the treat what we are doing uh, not as business as usual. So it's about... <laughs> so if I can synthesize what I heard you say, you said to really move Africa forward in line with Njoroge's question, it's about not doing business as usual. So going back to your the conversation earlier about thinking unconventionally, about um, recognizing what you have in your own backyard and not just waiting for someone to come and find value in your own, you know, uh, uh, richness that you have. It's also about um, pan-African collaboration um, and uh, breaking down barriers like what the African continental free, free trade area is trying to do. And also about leadership and, and, and political leadership that ultimately uh, prizes creating opportunity for the, the, the vast majority that do not have, and not simply f enriching the few that already do. So um, that's the blueprint for Africa, people. <laughs> um, okay, so we're now gonna take some questions from, from the, 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 the audience in the room, and I'm gonna invite uh, Alice to take us to this part. <clears throat> Good afternoon again, Your Excellency. My name is Joel Tkwajirezu, and I'm from the African Leadership University. Uh, pursuing international business and trade in my third year. Um, my question goes, um, after the liberation war in 1994, you had to set, have, you had a mindset of saying, let's work together, let's put aside vengeance, and you had to also work with people who were in the government um, of the overseer of the genocide uh, against the Tutsi in 1994. So I wanted to know what was the mindset as one of the person who were affected directly or indirectly by the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994? In that case, we had to sort of put aside a little bit our personal grievances that actually rose to the national level because there were so many involved, but for a reason, for a reason of reality that there is nothing you could do at that moment or even any other moment to, to reverse what happened. You could only manage it and, and try to come out fine in the circumstances, but you couldn't uh, as a country, we are not going to be able to recover what we lost. <laughs> we lost people and there was no way of returning them. So, one, you have to think about how to manage that. The second, you also have to find a way of managing the future. <laughs> uh, and more importantly, the future those who are still alive and those who will be there tomorrow and the country and, and so on and so forth. So where we had to start from was to try and hold the country together. In fact, at one time we had a mixture, of, even in the government, as uh, you mentioned, where even in the government, we, there, there were people who also sympathized with the, even the perpetrators of uh, <laughs> that genocide. Uh, or, or, or even who are being accused, actually, 
but we were looking for evidence. Some people were being accused of actually having participated, but they were sitting in a cabinet. So you, you see here, you, you, you try to transcend almost this impossibility of saying how, but this man is a kira, so he's suspected to be a kira. Well, there are signs that you, how do you have him in the cabinet? The answer quietly in one's mind is, yeah, you have such a people in the cabinet at that moment so that you can secure the future. <laughs> Uh, you remember one time um, on these commemoration days, uh, a young uh, woman asked me a very touching and maybe complicated uh, question. When uh, she asked me publicly and said, uh, President, uh, it's like, why do you keep burdening the survivors? with uh, this weight of reconciliation so that the country moves on. You know, in other words, she was telling me, you know, actually, you, 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 every burden about that is just loaded onto us, which, which I thought was true, which I mean, which, which was true, which is true. So, I wasn't really so much prepared for that question in that moment. It's like, why? Well, you are always telling us, forgive, do what? And so it's like uh, everything happened to us, but you still come to us and say, please allow us to move on. <laughs> so I, I anyway quickly thought, it almost caught me unawares. And, but I, I quickly learned, remembered something that I had to tell the woman that you know what, uh, we burden you with all of this responsibility and the weight of everything because you are the ones who have something to give. Because what I meant was we need sort of reconciled the extremes. Is it the extreme of the victims who, who, who suffered to the extreme, and then there's the side of the perpetrators, the extremity of what they actually did. I said, the only person I can turn to and go to and say, please forgive, and ask for forgiveness or to give the other forgiveness, is the victim. I can't go to the perpetrator and say, and say what? If, I, if you went to the perpetrator, what do you ask him to do? Just say, oh, don't kill again next time, you know, you see. No, this is not an issue to beg from somebody. You just say, if you were thinking of doing it again, you need to be put in the right place. So, therefore, the burden was ended up being on the side of the victims because they are the ones who had something to offer, to give to society, and that is something very difficult to go beyond your pain and, and provide something that can help address the stability of our country for the future. For the perpetrators, there is little or nothing to, to, to be able to, you can't just go begging them to be better citizens next time, no, that's not. Uh, so, what was on our mind were all these things, the complexities of, uh, of our society, of what happened, and how to get out of it. So, one way was to have these people represented even in the cabinet. <laughs> yes, and say, okay. And then allow time you know, to deliver also on some of the means and the capacities to be able to address uh, the many grievances we couldn't address because we do not have means or institutions to take care of that. 
So that, that's what happened. Mm. Your Excellency, the, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, I'm Ronald Mugabo, a student in level four pursuing law. I'm currently the girl president of University of Rwanda Way Campus and the girl president of University of Rwanda. I'm very thankful to the president's office which gave me this opportunity of meeting my role model of today. So I have a question. Uh, for my sake, I'm going to be specific to my university because uh, there is a problem uh, in, we have. There is a problem of agriculture. Agriculture is contributing all the country's economy. But students from masters, masters from University of Rwanda, College of Agriculture, Animal Sciences, and Veterinary Medicine, programs of crop science, agribusiness, agroforestry, soil management, and animal production. After being enrolled to master's programs, they are facing a problem of lack of tuition fees and living allowance from 2009. As before, and some other programs, they are being catered off and they are being given those scholarships and bursaries. So, Your Excellency, we request, if it would be possible, you can take part in, the, in that situation and you see if those students can be facilitated also. The other question we have when countering, there is a problem of these new campuses you're having. There is Rusizi Thank campus. Thank you very much. Can we just have one question? We okay, can thanks answer a lot. that one first. Thank anyway, uh, the, the, the only thing I can promise and say about that is uh, I have no problem uh, working with those responsible to look into the matter and come out with the best uh, thing we can do for, for the well-being of the students or even the faculty or, or, or the university. So uh, on that one, I can promise you, uh, I'm sure those responsible might be here listening. So we, we'll take it forward and see what we can do to address the problem. Uh, thank you so much, Your Excellency, President Paul Kagame, Dr. Swanika. My name is Martina Abera Kawagambe. I'm currently a third year student at the African Leadership University pursuing global challenges. Uh, so um, in 1994, after the liberation struggle in Rwanda, a lot of people were scared, those inside the country and outside the country, and they were expecting a lot of chaos and havoc. But that was not the case. This country saw and experienced reconciliation and were given and provided hope for a better tomorrow. Now, currently, in, African, in this African continent, different countries are experiencing coups and chaotic changes or shifts in their leadership or governments. Now, my, president goes, my question goes to you, uh, Your Excellency, President Paul Kagame. I would like to ask you, what is the ingredient for a smooth transition that leads to a positive transformation that is also inclusive? Thank you. You remember, I was going to say 94 to maybe 99, uh, we were really struggling. There was a lot of chaos or confusion, especially 94, 5, 6, uh, things were not as, as uh, good as they are today. So we had our own share of that uh, uh, situation of chaos and, and confusion. Um, so, we, we, the world sometimes, and we keep seeing this everywhere, and we keep saying it, we'll keep, people keep talking about learning lessons. This is something that is common everywhere in the world. They say, ah, oh, learn from lessons, learning lessons. It is the UN, it's the country X, why, you learn lessons. Actually, the world and the countries don't learn lessons. They just end up, <laughs> and you wonder why. Even in our situation, in Rwanda, uh, the world said, you know, Rwanda imploded, and, you know, 
genocide, chaos, and so on. And you, want, and you had the UN here, and you had other people, even countries from outside. But still, bad things happened. Terrible things happened. They happened at the time they were here, from the beginning, the terrible things, you know, or problems of managing the chaos continued, and the countries were here. And then every time there is that discussion, well, for sometimes uh, academic uh, debate, purposes, wherever they say, oh, lessons from here, lessons from Rwanda about this. But these lessons don't serve anyone, it seems, because people just end up. So we learned our lessons. There's no question about it. Uh, maybe enough, uh, maybe not enough, uh, but uh, the, what we learned was to pick our pieces from this tragedy we had in our history, try to mold something out of it, uh, a country that came back to be Rwanda and then moved forward. And in doing that, and based on the lessons learned, was to be inclusive, to bring in everybody. This is why earlier we were talking about sometimes bringing even into cabinet people whose backgrounds were questionable. Uh, but doing it deliberately so that you, you give time for healing or for finding the means to deal with the situations that you are not able to deal with at that moment. And, and also maybe give an opportunity to this person either to defend themselves or to be better people in the future. So it, it's about doing everything you can to try and you know, bring these pieces together and for the better future. So now, about the rest of uh, other parts of our continent. If people learned lessons, maybe some of those things could be avoided. I won't have to name names or anything. I, I'll be careful not to do that because I, I don't want to be the problem. The problem is already there, so I don't want to be, <laughs> to be used as an excuse now to be the problem. Uh, but you find what, what leads to some of the coups, maybe not all the coups, but the coups will come out of discontent, political discontent. And in fact, unfortunately, all these things about uh, coups or, or sometimes when, where they have not happened, where you could actually say this situation even it deserves a coup, you see, but it doesn't happen. But it happens amongst the elites. The, the ruling elites, you know, the ordinary people who are the majority, the, the, the ones we serve, the ones we, even that elect us in, to serve in, in office and, and so on. Sometimes they really have no say because, or many times, there are situations where they have no say, even when they go for elections, uh, they elect uh, Fred, uh, and the winner is Kagame, is, is Paul, not Fred. So somehow, uh, Paul, who has been in power, uh, when it is Fred, he says, no, 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 he uses the means of government to make sure that uh, Fred does not go through. And it's, so Kagame stays on the basis of the political power 
I have in my hands or the military control I have, you know, and so on and so forth. So, in a way, the, the conflict is like, remains between Fred and Kagame. The ordinary people who were involved to elect their leaders will just uh, go back home and uh, go to their farms and, uh, and wait for another call for elections after four or five years, or, 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 doesn't matter how many. So when situations are like this, sometimes, People get tired of Kagame manipulating and uh, you know, there have been so many attempts uh, uh, and, and, and maybe actually Fred might win several times, might stand for in, in different elections like three times winning but the results are in my favor because I, have, I can still twist them in my favor. Now, in between, and this is a question all of us can think about and have their say on. When you have these so-called elections that have gone on and the wrong person winning, suppose some parts of uh, the country, they say the, 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 the army, which, which is really should, which really should not even be, which should not be part of the politics, but which I used in my favor because I was the president and uh, involved them in the politics. Suppose the part of it actually carried out a coup. We have found ourselves, now the, pro <laughs> the problem here again is sometimes they may not cut out a coup in favor of the person who actually won elections. <laughs> and say, you see, we, we, we followed, we knew you, 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 you cheated, you didn't win, it's Fred who, who won, so we take over and give it to Fred, no. They talk over and take it themselves. <laughs> so you, you have three people among the elites who are disgruntled and who are fighting each other. It's me, it's Fred, and it's the army, the part of the army. As you see, this really does not involve adequately the people we, we, we lied to and said they are going to choose their leaders. But this gives, takes me to another point. So in, in, in this case, if the coup happened, we, we, we have now gone to a point where we ask ourselves, is it a bad coup or is it a good coup? <laughs> Originally, all coups are supposed to be bad, isn't it? Yes, coup d'etat have no place ordinarily in our society or in our politics. Uh, the army should stay out of politics and should, that's what we know and that's the ideal situation we know. But then we have started having these realities where, you know, in the politics then comes corruption, then comes nepotism, then comes, uh, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and I'm sorry to say, you, you see it uh, in more than one uh, places on our continent. You see where it is just so, oh, so you're ruling, oh, then the family, the tribe, the, against others. This is not good politics. This, this can lead to anything. Now, especially corruption. Uh, so this is where now these people are going through to 
to cut out schools. And in the end, you get confused when you, you say, oh, in that place there was a coup. Then deep in your heart, you can say, well, I saw it coming. Because you saw what maybe the leaders were doing. But otherwise, leaders supposed to have been elected leaders who should not be touched. But because of these realities on the ground and the things as they developed and maybe the mistakes they made, and, and the tribes and the corruption and the, all kinds of things, one or the other happens. And then the rest of the world is, oh, and it's when, when we say, no, 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 this school should not be there. Should not have been there, you saw everybody out and so on and so forth. Well, the reality is, is increasingly turning out to be different. Sometimes the, the people with the Fred now get an opportunity and say, no, but what are you talking about? Uh, maybe these coup makers are, are okay because, after all, even the one who has been there, you, you are saying the coup has been carried against him, is not the one we erected. We erected the Fred. So they will go out on the streets celebrating. Right? So it, 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 it throws everything in turmoil, in chaos. Even people start saying, yeah, but. What are the people saying? The people are saying, yeah, they are happy with this. Even if you say the, the coup makers, making a coup is bad, but they are, they are, they are, there is an argument. People will say, no, but these are bad, but the ones they removed are worse. So <laughs> which way do you go? <laughs> you just go for the bad or for these ones who are worse. So this is what we are, it's a problem that really needs to be looked at critically. Yes? Uh, because if, if I'm going to entrench myself, no matter what people say, if they, I lose and Fred is the winner and I say, no, I am the winner. Then you start losing the legitimacy. There's no question about it. And if a coup happened, then people will say, so be it. Of course, you know, we are very polite when it comes to that. Or diplomatic, I don't know what to call it. Nobody will really come out and say, uh -huh, this coup was justified. They always say, no, 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 but you see, you know. What is the African Union saying? What is so-and-so saying? And nobody will say anything. <laughs> so that's where we end. So, my friend, the question is, uh, is as loaded as, as you can have it. It's, it's very <laughs> Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Diana Wamahoro. I'm a student at the University of Rwanda. We have to be short to the point and then somebody else yeah, and then we, we cover three instead of one in the same time. <laughs> thank you. My question is, uh, we have seen our country trying its best to deal with the pandemic, I mean the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have also seen the government doing its part. Then my question is, then what do we need to do as youth? I mean. As young people, we have been hearing saying that we have to be doing big things and also taking care of the small things for yeah. their attention. Then what do we need to do, be it now, be it the Rwandans and the Africans at right, large? Right. Thank you. Right. So young people, first and foremost, take care of yourselves. That's number one. <laughs> as much as you can. Uh, like you are putting on the mask and, you know, keep your hands clean, don't go into congested uh, areas. I know you have given up uh, being in the nightclubs or other places. 
So uh, keep, keep trying. Especially for us, we have to even take care of ourselves more than others because while others are vaccinating, we have in most cases been left without vaccination. So those, the vac vaccination, the vaccine has its own protection it gives to people. So that one we have lacked largely. largely. So we use all other methods, we, science tells us, uh, to try and protect ourselves. So please start with that. The second is, Ourselves really means each other. Don't, don't protect yourself and think it ends there, no. Protect the one next to you as well. That's what putting on the mask means, in, in fact. It's not just uh, uh, protecting yourself, it's also protecting the other one next to you. So once the message is clear, the understanding of what we need to do in this uh, problem, problematic situation of a pandemic like this. There's what you have to do to protect yourself, there's what you same time protect others, then contribute to, for example, when there are lockdowns, when there are this, when there's working from home. Yes, quickly learn how to work from home and as productively as if you physically went to or in person to the office, or to other place of work. Uh, so there are these limits that are set. We quickly understand them, we quickly understand why they, they are there, and then we conform to that, but try and do our best to uh, maximize on what we can have in the situation. Uh, so always being proactive and responsive. And, and when uh, this, we, ha we happily get a vaccine to vaccinate people, you should be one to go in front of the line and, and be vaccinated if, if the vaccine has not, not uh, well, I'm not going to preach to anyone, but there are people who start having ideas, you know, either conspiracy theories or some, I don't know, say if they put this thing in me and, you know, there's a friend of mine uh, I, I got to know who was not uh, going to be vaccinated. So when I met uh, her, I, I said, why, why, why don't you take a vaccine? Then she told me her thinking, that uh, she has been told by some scientifically aware people that uh, vaccines are actually bad. They leave, so, you know, some bad things in our bodies which may affect us. Uh, I've said, we've been a long time, even if maybe in 30 years and so, you end up in a bad shape. So, but that person is almost my age. <laughs> so, I, I asked her, I said, but if you got the virus, uh, what chance do you have? I said, if you got the virus now and you're not vaccinated, the chances are not uh, plenty. I said, well, if you got vaccinated like me now, you're telling me I have 30 years to worry about the problem. <laughs> I think I'll go for that one. <laughs> I'll go for... <laughs> I, I'll go for the worry of, of the next 30 years than just uh, be knocked out in a week. <laughs> so, uh, so young people just need to be 
uh, proper engaged and responsive and uh, taking care of yourselves and contributing to the well-being of the nation and uh, uh, among other things. Uh, thank you, sir, for this opportunity. My name is James Abrahams. I'm a Kenyan from Kigali Independent University. My question is touching on the integration in East Africa, basically, and the promulgation of the African continental free trade area. As young people here today, we are gathered uh, to get your knowledge on this. And in your experience as the, as the former chair for the East African community, what are some of the areas in which we are not performing to the best of our ability that can help us integrate better and do trade with each other? Basically, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good. You, you, you start from home. Let's say, even here, before you cross the border to anywhere, just make sure that we, as a system, as a country, we are trying to do the best. We are productive, we are working with each other, we are, we, we, we are building capacity to compete uh, in the marketplace uh, on anything. Start with that. And second, Yes, look for opportunity beyond your borders, because there is a, a lot more in actual fact. So the, the, the continental free trade area on our continent was created so that there can be this free movement of people, of goods, of services, and so on. So broadening not only the market, but of course, for the sake of those who are serving or working in it. Uh, so that, that, is, that, that, is, that should be the thinking and everything else will be coming straight to you. Hey, what, what are you doing internally here? What are we doing? What, uh, what are we building? How competitive are we here? even satisfy our market and then work beyond that market, small market of Rwanda, to neighbors. And so I'm sure the same thing is happening with, with others across borders from the other side of the border. People want to come and do business with you and invest with you. And uh, so back and forth, competition, innovation, delivering on the market what you think you can produce competitively and, and, and sell it there. So that, that's really what we need to be doing. And as young people, you need to master this sort of thinking. And don't pity yourself, work hard, put every energy you have into it and be able to move. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Mandir. I am from Djibouti, and I'm a graduating student at the African Leadership University. At the African Leadership University, we are told to dream big, to dream bold, and my question is, um, is Rwanda capable to uh, welcome the World Cup? And if yes, when do you think it might be possible? To welcome one? Sorry again, I didn't. Yeah? Yes. Is well, Rwanda well, capable to welcome the World Cup? Yes. If yes, when do you think that might be possible? Thank you. First of all, I, I, I agree with what uh, African Leadership University is teaching. Thinking big and being big. I, I entirely subscribe to that. That is, that for me, the starting point. The second is about the World Cup, right? You see, I'm lucky because there is, there is no threat that I might have it tomorrow. <laughs> because it is already booked for... <laughs> the countries are known for, you know, maybe the next 20 years. So I have myself to prepare for the next 20 years, right? So, you never know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, please. Your Excellency. Thank you, Your Excellency, for the bonus. Short, short. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Tuise Fabrice. I'm in School of Law at the University of Kigali. Uh, my concern goes to Dr. the CEO of uh, ARU. Uh, sir, you've said that uh, uh, if you want uh, to get an opportunity, please join the loom. And then uh, my concern is that sometimes you find that in that particular room there is a lot of you know person uh, with a different you know position. So uh, it was like, what are some criteria that one may follow as in to know the right person to go to? Thank you, yes, sir. Hello? Maybe I answered earlier even some of your questions. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they were coming to you and I assumed they were coming to me. I thought you were the guest of honor, but I'll answer your question very quickly. Um, you know, my advice to you when you're in a room with people who have opportunities is uh, to take the time to build relationships with them. Um, you know, one of the, I, I talk that, I described that there are four steps to building a relationship, right? So when you meet someone for the first time, you have a, a, a connection with them. Maybe there's some chemistry, you have something in common, you exchange some ideas, they give you their card, you give their phone number, that's the first step. Then the second step, you get to continuous interaction. You exchange emails, you meet up for lunch, you take WhatsApp messages, you, you, you spend time together. And through that continuous interaction, the person gets to see whether you are someone who's a doer or just a talker. And they get to understand, your, are you a person with integrity or not? Are you someone who has the skills you're saying you have? And then they start to really form trust with you, which is the third stage. And then only when you have trust, you get to fourth stage, which is collaboration. That's when you now can do something together. You get a job, you get venture capital for your business, you get funding for your nonprofit, whatever it is. So the mistake I see so many young people making is they meet someone today and then they expect something from them tomorrow. And you haven't done the work to show that you are someone, like the president was saying earlier, that you also uh, are using the little that you have to, to get ahead, to do the best you can, and that you're someone that can be trusted, and then that they can invest in you. So that's my advice for you is take time to build relationships just for relationships sake. Don't just be going and getting things from people. The final thing I'll say is um, you, you, know, you need to think about relationship building like a bank account. You can't just withdraw from it and take, take, take. You also need to give, especially if you're a leader. Your role as a leader is not just to get stuff, it's to give and to create opportunities for others. So just as you are in the room and you're getting opportunities, you must be creating opportunities for other people. And if you do that, then you'll find that you'll succeed. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Benin Isawane, representing Davis College at Aquila. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, as someone who has always been the key person behind the Rwandan development, uh, I would like to hear from you, what is the one key thing that guides you and makes you capable of doing uh, all the things you do in such a unique way as you do. Thank you, sir. I, I, for lack of better ways of putting it, uh, I find, first of all, there is something maybe I'm not really very responsible for. Nature. Nature, you know, shapes you the way it wants sometimes. Maybe your genes or something. So there are things. Then there is also the nurture, the environment. So for every human being, by the way, I'm, I'm not talking about myself. So the environment shapes you, combines with the nature, the person. Then, so in the, in the environment, you learn things, you are attracted to some, you reject others, you want to do things, you have, you develop uh, interests in, so because of what you've been exposed to and so on. So, dear, for me, 
what I've done, uh, contributed to for this country and with others, comes from sort of that background. So the, 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 the environment uh, I, I grew up in and then uh, probably part of me that I, I, I'm not very, I can't say uh, I determined uh, on that. It's like I did not determine what my height is or what my big size is. So I can sometimes you, these are things that happen to you and you are not responsible, really. You cannot. But then once you are there with that, and then so for me, thrust into the world of Rwanda and then politics and the history of Rwanda. So I have benefited one way or the other. Uh, from this compression of nature and nature. So that's, that's how I happen to be doing things the way I do. Um, thank you, His Excellency. Um, Junius Bonu from Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. Um, I wanted you to tell us, we've seen what have been done by you and your team regarding digital transformation of Rwanda. A lot of countries are still trying, and I want you to tell us the, the key ingredient of such a successful digital transformation, and if you were to give an advice to um, an aspiring African future tech leader, what would it be? I wish, uh, I wish you had asked the person next to you. She's, uh, she's responsible for things digital. <laughs> But I think it's like um, many other things. Well, it is about people. You have people. You have young people who... Uh, and then, as I said earlier, most things are driven by our political thinking as well. Uh, but you have the people, you have the thinking, the, and then the rest is to put to be organized and put the tools in place, which are in the end a part of the investments you make in the people, in people, infrastructure. And then when these things have happened, they start producing what encourages other people to, what it is, if you see how uh, digital technology drives businesses, drives uh, the services. Or, as we said, even during the pandemic, you see, I think to a decent extent we, we, we did fine because the thinking, the infrastructure, the people, the tools were already in place. So once people said, oh, no going back to place of work, nothing, you know, you need to work from home. It's like people woke up and say, oh, actually it is possible because we already have this. We're only going to do it in the office, but you could do it from here using these tools we have. And so it's uh, the investments never go wrong once you have invested in the people, in the policy, uh, in infrastructure, uh, and then uh, the politics of it will drive it. But more so, uh, it will be accelerated by what you see is already the outcome, what, what starts happening that you find is beneficial. Advice? Advice for an aspiring technology leader. He, wa of, uh, he wants to be a, a technology leader in Africa, and he's uh, asking, what advice would you give for someone like him? Oh, it is, you grasp those ideas and uh, <laughs> find your place in, in, in the middle of that. <laughs> OK. Uh, my name is Daniel Angarambe. I'm a master's student in electrical and computer engineering at CMU Africa. 
And my question is, despite being the lowest emitting continent in the world, in Africa... Large, despite? Despite being the lowest emitting continent, emitting continent in the world. Lowest emitting continent. Okay, right, right. Africa is facing a lot of repercussions in terms of climate change. And my question was, how can the youth contribute to slowing down climate change in Africa and improve intercontinental relationships to fast track this agenda? Thank you. I, I need to write a book f f for the answer. It's, 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 it would be a long answer, but, <laughs> uh, but I, I think um, I understand what you are saying. Uh, the Africa being uh, more at the receiving end, really, of the climate crisis, and yet uh, not contributing as much as... Uh, so what we need to do is to start early ourselves, not to solve the problem, so you, we have to leapfrog, not to start solving the problem by going the route of those others who are emitting and are trying to reverse and then trying to reverse that ourselves in the wrong run. So we have to leapfrog. It's adoption of these technologies that uh, are green in their nature and uh, also uh, trying to think hard about the, the very policies that can because like now we are, we are developing in many ways, we are starting from a low base. If we start adoption of these technologies, for example, and uh, uh, developing that way, we, we have a chance, first of all, of uh, uh, managing our situation the way it should be ourselves, but also use that as a basis uh, for the others now who even are polluting the world more than ourselves and making certain demands uh, so that maybe in the future people start paying for their level of, of, of polluting uh, our environment. Uh, so you will be on the good side of that from the... Uh, but this requires a concerted effort. It requires all of us to understand, and it doesn't matter which field you are in. It's about the thinking, so that you contribute to the future well-being. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Mohammed Umar. Uh, I'm from Sudan. I study AI at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, my question is: You have made it. You have made a strong point on. Uh, addressing the African context and uh, grassroots solutions. Uh, but I also recognize that this is a very um, common political talking point for many African leaders. I would like you to tell us from your long what? experience. Uh, Fred, Fred, is, is the addressing what? The, the African context. The African context. Yes. Okay. All right, but right. yeah, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a common echoes, political point uh, for many African leaders. And from your long experience, and because I truly believe that uh, you are the only person I can trust <laughs> to actually answer me uh, transparently about that, what do you think is the African context? Because, of course, it's not just development. The Global South has very similar social illnesses and economic illnesses to Africa. What makes Africa unique? Is it just a political talking point uh, to pass on things like um, you know, native, uh, native and local polit uh, policies without being bothered. And how can we use this knowledge of really addressing and knowing what exactly um, you mean by the African context in developing and creating truly African, truly strong, truly effective uh, institutions, uh, technological frameworks, and uh, solutions to build the Africa of tomorrow? Thank you. You see, the African context, if you will, really means the African story, because Africa 
was not born yesterday. Africa has been there for a long time. And then we have seen how things have evolved over many years. Uh, so in that African story and the context, if you will, there is the African itself context and how it interacts with external factors or actors. So th these have come together. So what I mean, therefore, when I'm talking about the, 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 the African context myself or the way I understand it, is these two things as mashed together. And so from the perspective of the African, what do you want? You may not say, no, I'm going to be the African uh, of uh, 18th century or 17th. That's the, the, the original, the, the real African. You know, the, 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 that evolution and the interaction between the, the African story and the externalities that affected it have formed a completely different context or evolution where we find ourselves. And in that, there are things we have to accept and others we have to reject. Uh, one simple thing, the, the, the mentality of it. Uh, if there is any notion that the African story has to be shaped from outside, it's what the outside tells us to do that you do, uh, I will say, no, that's not uh, correct. I will say, at least the minimum, we should talk about it. You see, you give me a chance to interact with you on what you think is good for me. That is the minimum. Uh, and that is different from saying, no, don't talk to me, don't say anything to me. Leave me alone to my African context as, as I explain it, as I think it is. Because we, in the end, we don't think about that the same way, even as Africans. So there has got always to be that back and forth. It's like, no, give me a moment. If you are from outside and you say, no, 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 you should be doing this, you do this. I say, no, no, but this is Africa. You are from somewhere else. And I know, I'm conscious that the African story is this meeting point of the Africa itself as it has always been and uh, has been evolving, but also with the interaction with the rest of the world, because there is not going to be that without that interaction. So now, th that is for me the African context I'm talking about, and we should be able to explain it. You see, um, I think that point was, is very good, in, but very broad in a sense. You see, it's like uh, in, in a country. You find a country in Africa, X, or let's even uh, call it Rwanda. Uh, the politics might be wrong or go wrong. It's not serving really the interests of the people of Rwanda. Or the leaders may be the wrong leaders uh, who even do harm to their own people, the people they are supposed to lead, including sometimes killing people, your own people. There is no such a situation that is going to justify that you are going to do these wrong things. And the people should keep quiet because this is your country, this is your Africa, this is your country. No. <laughs> The, the, the African or the continent or the country or the African country 
also has certain standards, has certain values, has certain minimum. You see, it's like uh, even in our own country in 94, when the genocide was taking, was happening, actually there were all kinds of uh, arguments across the world, including at the UN. By the way, that when it happened at the UN, Rwanda was holding a, a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council. So, and, and this, the, the ambassador who was there at the time, really was arguing, it was like telling people off. It's like, uh, what we are doing in Rwanda is our business. You see what I mean? So it's like, no, this is uh, the African, this is the Rwandan story, leave us alone. No, there is no, leaving, when it crosses a certain line, it is no longer just Rwandan. It's, it has become uh, internationalized. It's to be looked at in the very wide context of the world standards and what is expected of you. Uh, so we have to be careful so that indeed people don't abuse the African context. The African context, if properly defined and described, has nothing wrong with it. If you take care of all of these needs and, and parameters that have to be uh, driving our, our, our politics and our development and, and, and that context. So to the African Union, therefore, African Union is a structure that is in place that brings together Africa through which we can bring these ideas or grievances or you know, any misunderstandings and we, or, or different ideas we don't agree on and try and narrow the gaps that are there and, and see if we can make a, so that's why people sometimes are in or out and saying this or that, saying that, or when it come, happens to a problem and say, oh, African Union needs to intervene, some people, the Africans themselves may be uncomfortable and say, oh, you know, I don't, because then you, you realize there's something wrong because why would you be afraid of the African institution getting involved? Uh, it, it's, that trying to run away from, you know, being able to come up front and explain what you are doing and say there is nothing wrong. So, in other words, you are you are just fearing accountability or being held accountable, and that's why you are avoiding it. Otherwise, and and if anything, if the institution of the African Union was going to do something and there's something wrong, there are also ways of checking it and say no, no, no. These structures that supposed to, that is supposed to be serving all of us, is not actually serving all of us. Is has gone astray. Then there is somebody to come up and say, no, no, no. we can check that excess if if there is. But there can be excess with the country or with the institution. So, but voices should come up and say what they want to say uh, about uh, correcting something. But the African context is there and exists and should be actually strengthened. But wearing, bearing in mind of, uh, you know, this interaction with, uh, on the final point on that, you see, I really, find it problematic in that interaction that something, somebody believes they have the right and the power and everything to say something about you and even be consequential about that and when you cannot say anything about them, <laughs> you see that, that, that is, I would not mind if you would come to me and say, you know, this is wrong, please, you know, you must change. I say, okay, then I look at it. 
But you should accept that at one time, if you are doing anything wrong, I should be able to point out and say, hey, please, what is going on? <laughs> yes. Otherwise, we, we, have, uh, we would have such a bad imbalance where, you know, it's like uh, everyone right here, east, west, north, east, uh, uh, south, north, south. I, had, I always hear people talking about God, right? Uh, and when they are talking about God, it's like God is good for all of us, right? I don't think God would have made one part of the world more important than the other part. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Khalil, uh, a Tunisian student in Carnegie Mellon, Africa, focusing on IT entrepreneurship. So I totally get, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm totally amazed by how Rwanda is now trying to be a business hub. So one of the questions that I want to ask is how today Rwanda is trying to support their, to build startups here and also to expand them. And uh, meanwhile, also how to support African startups to also come to Rwanda. And by support, is, it's, it includes programs, uh, tax reduction, uh, financial support, and everything. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, you have said it all. You have actually answered the question. <laughs> That's exactly what you want to do. The timeline. Sorry? The timeline. Ah, oh, timeline. Because I saw Startup Act, which have been already a work on project, but I guess it got postponed, thanks to COVID. Yeah, timeline, it shouldn't go beyond the next three years, actually. Okay. But if we can do it in one year or less, that's what we will do. Perfect. Right? So it is, it is a journey we are walking, knowing that many things we don't have in place, uh, but we are trying to put in place as quickly as we can. But I should say, I would be more comfortable from now, going forward, we should see a lot of progress and there should be no questions in the next uh, or beyond uh, two, three years.